Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Way We Work series, where we will be exploring current and future trends in testing. We've had two webinars so far this week. The first webinar was with Graham Thomas and Philip Isles on programming for testers, and we also gave away an ebook on programming for testers from Graham and Philip. Yesterday, we had a webinar on DevOps with Rob Lambert and his team at New Voice Media. And today, I'm joined by Adam Knight, and he is going to be doing a webinar on big data and new testing challenge. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask Adam or if you have any feedback on the, the webinar, you can type your feedback or questions into the questions field on your control panel. And at the end of the webinar, we will go through them. We're running a competition now all week, and the lucky winner will receive a ticket to the Eurostar conference. And in each webinar this week, we are giving you a number. So what we're asking you to do is take note of the numbers in each webinar and add them up. And after tomorrow's webinar, we'll give you the email address where you can send your total answer. So if you missed out on the last two days numbers, just go over to Test Huddle and you'll see on the forum there the, the clues that you need. So now I'm going to hand you over to Adam and he's going to go through a session. So over to you, Adam. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Dara. That was uh, that was a great introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking today about big data, um, a, a new challenge for testing. Um, anyone who um, ha is unfamiliar with uh, with with myself or uh, has not seen a, a talk that I've done before, basically I head up the uh, the testing of a uh, a, a big data product um, called Rainstore. Um, for the last few years, it's been an independent company, but as of uh, as of December uh, last year, uh, Rainstore was acquired by Teradata. So now it is Teradata Rainstore. It's part of uh, uh, what Teradata described as their their unified data architecture. Um, I don't do any kind of talks or webinars in any kind of marketing capacity. I'm not here to try and sell you Rainstore, um, but I'm, I might need to explain a little bit about how it works just to, to kind of put into context the, uh, the, the challenges and the, the, the sort of solutions and, and ideas that we've come up with to, uh, to tackle the challenge of, uh, of testing big data. So um, big data, it's uh, a bit of a buzzword really if you look in sort of online and in marketing terms and things like that there's a lot of, of news around big data and it's, uh, it's it's sort of started to creep into television and, and sort of programs about big data analytics but um, interestingly it, it, uh, it that, that that trend doesn't seem to really have, uh, have necessarily pervaded into the the sort of software testing field um, I've uh, been speaking about big data for probably a couple of years now and um, and uh, this year I spoke at a conference called uh, Next Generation Testing, quite a good, uh, good fun day, one day conference down in London and as part of this conference um, they had a couple of sessions where they would set out tables and put subject uh, sort of uh, matter signs up on each table and have uh, sort of uh, uh, experts of, uh, in the subject sitting on the tables where people could go and have a discussion for an hour on the subject of interest. Um, so you had had um, a table um, talking about web testing and that was sort of a popular subject and some some kind of uh, uh, people who were had a level of expertise in web testing you know quite a, quite a, a, a strong subject with a lot of attendees on that table then then you looked at the the mobile app testing uh, table that was very very busy with people wanting to share their problems and ideas around the subject of, uh, of testing mobile applications um, you had other tables, you know, cloud testing is, is sort of an emergent market, a few people maybe around that one, and there, was, there were other subjects and, and other tables that were, uh, were, were nice and busy. Um, I was the subject matter expert on the, uh, on the big data testing table. Um, now, I, the, the, it wasn't quite that bad. I did have a couple of people, but relative to the other tables around the room, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a necessarily a hot topic, and this is totally understandable. Uh, big data testing is perhaps a bit of a niche market at the moment. It's not a problem that that many of us are facing, uh, the big data challenge, and, and a, num a number of times I've given talks so a conference and people have said, well, I'm, I'm kind of interested, but it's not really a problem that's affecting me at the moment. So, um, but I think, I think that's going to change. And this is, this is really the subject of my, uh, my talk today. So 
Uh, by way of just sort of a, uh, uh, a demonstration of the uh, the, the, the impending uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, way of uh, way of things, I did a Google search on um, big data product company logo, and this is what came back. So, as you can see, there's a there's a good uh, a good sort of uh, mix of uh, of companies in there. There's some traditional sort of organisations there, uh, some maybe new ones that people might not be so familiar with. There's some some uh, some technologies that maybe are, are, are associated with big data. So, but what we can see is there's a lot of companies getting a, getting a, a sort of handle into the idea of big data and the big data market. So. Yeah, I think that uh, that that we're we're going to need to grow into this uh, this this market, and uh, certainly it's a it's a, a challenge that uh, that more and more of us are going to face. Um, interesting stat from uh, from uh, Forbes. Now I always take statistics like this with a a kind of a pinch of salt, uh, but uh, but I thought that this this one was was quite interesting. Demand for application development skills in big data has increased nearly 400% in the first six months of this year, as compared to the the previous year. Uh, now you know we we can maybe read a little bit into this in the fact that these are jobs quoting big data, and maybe the same jobs that that were around previously might be trying to advertise themselves slightly differently to to, to jump onto a bandwagon. However, I think that that it does indicate this this sort of Scale of increase does indicate that, that the the field of big data is growing, and that software development in the field is is certainly uh, becoming a, a, a bigger market um, for for us to move into. Um, now, another thing that 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 really I think is 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 really going to sort of uh, to to push the big data uh, trend and the need for testing of big data products is uh, is the concept of the Internet of Things. Now I don't want to sort of preempt uh, Andy Stanford Clark's webinar tomorrow, um, but uh, but the Internet of Things is is a term that's come about to sort of describe the 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 interconnectivity and communication between uh, many many machines and devices that now form part of part of modern society. So uh, so this is uh, this is a growing uh, a growing trend. Gartner forecasts that uh, uh, 4.9 billion things will be connected um, in uh, in 2015, up 30% from last year, and they predict it will reach 25 billion uh, by the year 2020. Um, and the the reason that all of these things are connecting and the purpose of, of them connecting and joining up is to transfer data between them. This is why they're connecting, is to, to share information and to transmit information um, across the internet. Um, so so the, 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 the basis of the Internet of Things is data. It's a, it's a data problem that, uh, that is going to generate. Um, so people are realizing, and more and more businesses as well as individuals are realizing that, uh, that, that the value of the data that they have and the data that they, the opportunities they have to collect data. Uh, business data provides you with insight. It gives you insight into what people are doing, into what, uh, what your your products are doing, what the people are doing that, that visit your 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 products or your applications. And so, data that provides you with this insight is seen. As more and more as a business asset, and so the more opportunities that you have to collect data, and the more data that you collect, the greater the asset you have. And the Internet of Things furnishes us with the ability to to collect information from all manner of different devices and and uh, and pieces of software. So there's an expectation now in modern devices and, and systems of having that connectivity with other systems and having that ability to collect data. To expose it to the, uh, the 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 ability to analyze and, and provide uh, useful insights. Um, so I think inevitably, and this is this is uh, uh, purely my my kind of uh, uh, summary of the the different sort of. Uh, um, Areas we're going to see a growth in is by no means an exhaustive list, but we're obviously going to see a growth in connected devices as, as predicted uh, in, by the analysts. And um, in existing products as well, what we're going to see is uh, an, an increase in expectation around activity data capture. So capturing information about what that device is doing and storing more information about what's going on with the device. Uh, you know, activity is an opportunity to collect data that maybe people uh, are now seeing. So. And, and monitors around uh, 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 collecting that data are going to be uh, more prevalent. Um, you know, monitors on network traffic and and uh, and um, other things that maybe don't historically collect that information. So, 
we have data collection monitors. Those are going to need to, uh, to to be built around storage technology. You need to store all this information that's being collected in, in more and more efficient ways and more cost-effective manner. You need to be able to to furnish that data up to uh, to analytical uh, capabilities to provide you with those insights. So we've got this whole sort of connected web of of capture, monitoring, storage, analytics, and and inevitably there are going to be management and control systems in place to 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 manage those uh, those monitors manage that collection of data and, uh, and 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 provide people with the ability to control what's uh, what's going on so um, all of these things are going to need to be tested so more and more we're going to see uh, the, the internet of things kind of providing this big data uh, challenge for testing that, uh, that that more and more software systems are going to involve the processing and the the manipulation of vast quantities of information so what is it that uh, big data is? What makes it big data? Well, that's an interesting question. A lot of people can sort of think it's a very much a buzz term and uh, and it's nothing new. And and to to many uh, that is to a great extent that is the case. Um, however, what, what, one of the things that I find when looking at articles and looking at, uh, at sort of summaries of what uh, what big data is, the the same phrase comes up again and again, and that is that big data is data that is too big. Um, it's data that perhaps is too big to manipulate and manage and process in ways that we may have uh, grown accustomed to in the field of IT that perhaps we would now consider traditional, such as uh, maybe sort of uh, uh, the traditional relational databases and things like that. So it's data that perhaps is too big to process in a way that, that, that we, we are familiar with and understand. Um, but what what does that mean? What is it too big for? Um, and uh, here are some some sort of thoughts that I've had from my experience of working with uh, with big data. So, is big data too big? to uh, count the individual. Obviously, we're talking about uh, masses and masses of, of files um, or records or whatever you want you are you are dealing with in the data capacity. Um, is it impossible to, to consider the individual? Well, no, not at all. Uh, my system, uh, for example, is uh, one of the implementation contexts for it is to, uh, to store uh, mobile phones records and one of the requirements of, of that those systems is to be able to drill down to an individual's mobile phone activity for either a day or a specific uh, period so no it's not too big to count the individual but what we can't do is is look at every individual we can't test every record in the system we can't look at every record in the system so sometimes the the approaches that we may historically have taken to do things such as data validation no longer apply and certainly in, in the, some of the early days of working with my system and customers that were using it their approach to data validation of, of the data they were storing was to, to sort of dump out all of the data from the, the, the archive system, all of the data from the, the source system, and try and sort and compare those. And, and this simply was impossible. They couldn't process that on, a, on, the, on the servers that they were running. It was just too big. So big data is, is data that may be too big to, to look at everything um, in, in one place. Um, so too big, too big to test every record or every file. Is big data too big to manipulate? Certainly it can be very, very hard and unwieldy to manage the, the sort of quantities of information we're talking about. Um, but no, it's not too big to manipulate because what uh, what people do, certainly um, a lot of the big data products that, that are available and the big data approaches will break problems down. They will distribute data into smaller chunks of files or, or, or partitions or groups and then they, the, the processing will uh, will be broken down as well into individual uh, uh, processes on, on, um, on maybe a, a core or a machine and that, that workload will be distributed across many cores and many machines in order to process information. So it can be manipulated but it is too big to manipulate the entire data set in one go. And that may be something that we may have grown accustomed to in testing is to be able to, to kind of easily copy around and move around uh, large data sets for our, for our testing purposes. So again, something that, that may present a challenge to us. Um, like this stricken uh, oil tanker here, is big data 
too big to back up? Um, well, yes, in a way that, that again, with the, the systems at the, the scale that people are running now, the, the, there isn't the, uh, the possibility maybe of, of, of taking the, the nightly backup tape of your database. You know, that, that approach which may have stood people in good stead historically of, of, of taking your, your sort of Oracle or your, or your SQL Server database and backing it up uh, for disaster recovery can't be done now. It's, the, the, the systems are too big. Um, and uh, and so, but what uh, big data products and, and big data um, uh, implementers typically will do is try and build uh, redundancy and resilience into the big data systems, such that you, you're you're taking an approach of disaster prevention rather than disaster recovery. So you'll have uh, for Hadoop, for example, puts uh, multiple copies of, of every file onto different machines in a Hadoop cluster, such that if one machine fails, you don't lose the data. Many uh, people will have uh, multiple uh, live sites uh, of their implementation such that if an individual site fails for some reason then they have a, a backup that they can uh, roll over to but what they can't do is is duplicate the entire uh, uh, production data you can't take a backup of the whole data and you certainly can't duplicate production data for testing and this is an approach that certainly I've seen in the past is if someone wants to, to say take a pre-prod copy to test an update of a piece of software or, or, or for sort of scale and performance testing, they will take a, a backup of, of production and put it into a pre-prod environment. Now, big data systems, as, as they've, they've evolved, it, they really are too large to, uh, to consider duplicating production for testing purposes. So that, that option is no longer available to us. Um, like this uh, supermassive black hole here, is, is big data simply too big to comprehend? Well, it, in a way, yes, but uh, what we find as, as, as humans is that we have a very good ability, a very good technique uh, sort of inherent in our thinking in order to deal with, uh, with scale. Um, so, for example, if we uh, were to measure the, the distance to, uh, between celestial bodies, we don't try and do it in kilometers. We will change our units of measurement to be more appropriate for the problem at hand. So we will talk in light years, and light years obviously many, many orders of magnitude uh, are greater than a kilometre. So we can change our units of measurement easily to allow us to, to, to cope with massive changes in scale. Um, similarly for storage, for example, we, we can easily shift from talking megabytes to gigabytes and, and terabytes and petabytes, and that allows us to, to, to in increase the scale of our discussions without losing sight of, uh, of, of what we're talking about. When we don't have that unit of measurement um, and, uh, and those sort of scalable uh, measures, then, then it can be too, uh, very difficult to consider scale. Um, and so say you take something like database records uh, or, uh, and, and try and consider scale at that level across a big data system, you, you soon hit problems. So, uh, you know, testing maybe uh, a, a query function or something like that against a million records may seem like a, a big test. However, when you're dealing with a, a system that maybe for a million records might constitute one data partition and you'd expect to have maybe a million data partitions in your system, then we can see that, that considering scale is, uh, is, is difficult when you've only got sort of units of measurement of an individual. So it is too big to try and consider all the levels of scale at once in a system. So this brings me on to a really interesting uh, point and one that I think is, is often overlooked when people are talking about big data. They talk about the sort of possibilities and the, the, the approaches of big data, but it presents a real challenge for testing. Um, as we saw from the examples I just gave, there are many different approaches in production that can be taken to, to get around some of the limitations um, of, uh, of production systems, but these um, still present a challenge to us in testing and the approaches we may previously have considered in order to, to test a software system. Um, so is it too big a challenge uh, to face for testing? Well, obviously not. I mean, it's, 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 many of us are doing it. However, what we do perhaps need to do is take a change in perspective about how we look at problems in order to try and tackle some of the challenges that big data presents. Just as you don't have to look at every mountain in a mountain range to understand the, the movements and the flows and the processes that go into to forming the, the, the shapes and the patterns of that mountain range, you don't need to look at every record, 
any big data system or every file to understand the movements and the processes and the 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 uh, the, the the activities that can form that big data system and, and and predict and model how that big data system is going to behave. So we might need to look, take a change in, in perspective about how we look at our systems to try and test them um, more effectively. Now, every big data system that I'm aware of um, will not take a brute force approach to, to processing scale. So um, you won't get every file stored in, in the same uh, location or you won't get every record in the, uh, in the, in the same database file. Uh, typically a big data system will work, as I've mentioned before, by breaking problems down and, and, and the, the problems that get broken down are both problems of storage and problems of processing. So what you'll get is the scalability layers built into the system where you, you break problems problems down and distribute them and then you have layers of processing which manage those individual components that you've broken down into. So um, typically in, in my system which is a, 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 a system which deals with more structured uh, database type data, um, as we've sort of developed our testing approach, what we've gone from is, is talking about the number of records in our test data to the number of partitions. So our system will store, as I mentioned, maybe up to a million records in an individual partition file. And what we've started to, as, as we've grown the scale of our operations, we've started to talk more often in the terms of the number of partitions in the system than necessarily the number of records. So that's a scalability point for us and, and, um, and certainly one that we, we would sometimes consider separately uh, from, from testing the, the number of records. Um, as well as the data in a big data system, what you typically get are layers of metadata to allow you to understand and locate the data you're interested in. No customer using a big data system wants to, to read every record or every piece of information in that big data system in order to, to satisfy their, their query. Typically what the, they'll want to do is drill down to specific files or specific pieces of information uh, um, to, uh, to allow them to get the answer that they want more quickly. And what allows them to do that is metadata. So as testers, understanding that those metadata layers is key to, to testing the, the systems that we are working on. Um, and the number of uh, machines in a big data system is, is something we might need to, to consider. Like historically, when I first started testing the product that I work on now, we, we, would, uh, we would were targeting an, an individual sort of single server installation. So we would, as testers, we would have one server that, that we would run our, our tests against and, uh, and that would be sufficient. However, as, as the sort of the big data uh, field has grown and what we're seeing is more and more systems that are, are uh, distributing workloads and, and, and information across um, clusters of machines. So many, many machines operating as a single sort of server unit um, and these clusters provide kind of resilience um, uh, across the cluster as well as obviously being able to distribute the processing um, of information. And now typically um, the, the tests and the testers in my, uh, in my company will, will not consider sort of testing, even functional testing or much more than about three servers because obviously we want to make sure that that cluster activity and those cluster operations are being are being handled and processed effectively. So as I mentioned, what we need to do is kind of change our, our perspective and our way of thinking about the systems to really understand the layers of scalability that go into making up our systems. If I, um, if we tried to uh, to test, um, and, uh, and we work in an agile approach in my organisation, if we tried to test on a, a nightly or even a weekly basis, um, running at the the scale, the full scale of a production installation of, of one of our customers, then we would really struggle to do it with the the resources and the the time and the hardware we have available. It takes, um, you know, it can take um, dozens of servers many, many months in order just to build up to production capacity on some of these things. Um, but what we can do is if we try and understand the system, and this is a very simplified representation of a, uh, a big data system. So you have, you have a, a metadata database that provides you information on the partitions of data in the system. So each of these partitions may contain um, a million records of information um, and there may be you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of these partitions in the system. 
And the, but the, the metadata layer, what it contains is the information maybe on the minimum and maximum values and the cardinality of the, the data in each partition, such that when you query, you just need to hit the, the, the few partitions that you're interested in, in order to satisfy your, uh, your request. Um, so what we can do as testers, if we understand this, this shape and this process, we don't actually have to have all of these other partitions populated with information. If these partitions present a realistic metadata layer, then all we need is a subset of the, the partitions to be populated with the data, perhaps a, a day's worth, to be able to satisfy a, a realistic query and ensure that our metadata processing is, uh, is performant and effective. And this is certainly an approach that we take um, in our testing, is, is scaling up a system with many, many small partitions, populating a subset of, of more realistic sized partitions and running queries to ensure that our, uh, our metadata processing drills down just to the partitions in question. So this, this uh, approach of trying to understand the layers of scalability and then just uh, uh, targeting the ones that we're really interested in um, allows us to, to be a little bit more surgical about scaling up our testing and, uh, and, and still giving us the ability to test in a reasonable time window. Okay, so one of the things that people often uh, talk about in, in testing is the, the idea of non-functional characteristics. So uh, non-functional characteristics are things like uh, uh, performance and scalability and, and uh, other factors like that that, uh, that may be not directly related to the, the, the actual sort of uh, functionality uh, per se of, uh, of the product. Now that's, that's uh, fair enough but I, I particularly from the, from the context of big data really don't consider that, uh, that, that any uh, characteristics are really non-functional because um, these non-functional characteristics for us are absolutely the cornerstone of our big data uh, technologies. Um, scalability is a function of a big data system. If, if the product doesn't scale, then, uh, then it isn't functional. It's, uh, it's an expectation of customers and it's a, a function of a big data system to be able to run across many, many processes and many servers. Um, similarly, performance is a function of a big data system. We're expected to deliver information in a timely fashion and if that information isn't delivered in a timely fashion, then, then the system simply isn't functional. So, so these, these what, what we describe as non-functional characteristics really do form the, the basis of many and many of our user stories and our requirements. So we, we, it's quite common to see user stories such as, you know, as a query user, I want my lookup queries to run in 50% of the time they do at present. Or um, as a cluster administrator, I want to store over a million uh, partition files with no loss of performance on my import. So these, these scalability and performance um, characteristics form the basis of many of our, our user stories and our targets because the, these characteristics are absolutely vital to the successful operation of a big data system. What we can't do, therefore, is leave the sort of the, the non-functional testing to a stage at the end or, or, or a phase. Our everyday testing needs to focus on these activities. The, the testers working on the stories in our agile sprints will need to focus on non-functional characteristics because that are the, are the, those form the acceptance criteria of our, of our stories that are going in. So we have to focus our everyday testing around the non-functional characteristics. And, and there are different sort of uh, approaches and, and methods that, uh, that we've adopted to try and help us to, uh, to do this. Um, one of those is, is um, uh, the, the idea that uh, when we're running tests, and particularly automated tests, we, uh, we try and capture as much information about what, is, uh, what the system is doing, both the, our software system and the operating system, as possible. Um, uh, I believe it, that, uh, that certainly automation is an opportunity to, uh, to collect information. It's not just there to furnish uh, a series of binary checks. It is an opportunity to collect information about what a system is doing. So capturing information is, a, is one of the key elements of, uh, of, of our activities, whether that's through automation or, or, or through exploratory testing. Um, uh, we use, for example, um, Ganglia is, is one of the tools that we, we use um, extensively in our testing for um, 
uh, for particularly for sort of soap testing activities and things like that, where we're we're running workloads on the system and we want to monitor what's going on. So Ganglia is a is a sort of grid uh, cluster monitoring system that allows you to define your own uh, metrics to uh, to publish from nodes in a multi-node system and uh, and analyze those. So we can use that to capture our information. But also, as I mentioned, the the automation harnesses are an opportunity to collect information, and 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 many of our harnesses will well, as they're running, collect information such as the the the, the memory of, uh, of the the core service or the the, the time of every, it takes to run every test step, for example, is captured. The memory usage while we're running every test step and things like that. So we'll try and capture as much information during a test run as possible to allow us to retrospectively come back and analyze what was going on, but also to give us the opportunity to use those harnesses in more exploratory ways uh, when looking at the behavior of the system. And I'll come on to that a little bit more. Um, a bit later. Okay, um, and checking also is is obviously very important for automation. We do need to to have checks that uh, that, that run to to tell us that our, our system is appears to be kind of still operating within the the uh, the, the constraints that we uh, that we we would expect and, um, and exhibiting the behavior that we'd hope. And um, what we can do in our in our core functional test harnesses is we can check against these uh, these uh, 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 non-functional uh, metrics that we're collecting. So any query in the in the for example in our test harnesses any uh, any activity any import can be timed um, such that we can put a tolerance around it to run on a specific server such that such that it, it can uh, it can be timed and if it, it falls outside that that timing tolerance then it will flag up as a an unexpected result that needs further investigation similarly we can apply a memory check so this is this is an example output from one of our test reports where the memory check um, has failed so we uh, we actually exceeded the expected limit of, of the memory on the uh, on the core service when running that step so this is this is building non-functional checking into uh, the the functional test activities because the those functional uh, uh, test activities are the output of our, our user stories and the non-functional characteristics as I mentioned often form the basis of those so we need to be able to apply checks um, that those characteristics are being uh, are being met okay um, so Automation, as I've, I've already kind of uh, mentioned, is uh, is hugely important in uh, typically in a, in a big data system. And uh, um, what, through working on our system, we've come up with a number of different sort of approaches um, to automation that uh, that have helped us and stood us in in very good stead um, as we uh, as we've tested the product. Um, one of the one of the, the main principles that I, um, I work to is that automation is is kind of an ongoing development which sits alongside your other development activities such that you try and um, have an approach of developing the tools um, to, to give you uh, the ability to do what you need as needs arise. Um, so that, that certainly um, has stood us in very good stead. Um, so, so here are some of the, the kind of capabilities that we've added into our automation harnesses over time. Um, parallelization. Uh, is an important one. Um, as I've uh, as I've mentioned, big data systems will typically um, uh, break down problems and parallelize processing across many many. Uh, cores or, or servers. So our automation harnesses, therefore, uh, it makes sense if they can, can parallelize activities and monitor these parallelized activities in order to, uh, to, to, to test um, a, a realistic um, uh, activity on the system and certainly that's what we've built into our automation harnesses is the ability to schedule uh, uh, activity across many machines in a cluster and and monitor and track um, activities um, and we have to work very closely with the developers to ensure that any asynchronous uh, activities in the system are, are trackable to completion such that we can test in a known state when those complete. So parallelization is, is, is essential to our, uh, to our core server um, testing activities. Randomization is, um, is uh, a key kind of element as well because when you're working with a, uh, a system which, uh, which is really built around uh, asynchronous um, activities, then, then it, it, 
the, the likelihood of concurrency problems is, is, is apparent and if you're just testing exactly the same timings every, uh, every time you run a test then the likelihood of exhibiting those problems is, is diminished so adding the ability to, to randomize even if it's just putting in slight delays between activities in, the, in, in parallel test packs gives us the opportunity to try and increase our chances of hitting a, a randomization problem or a sort of a concurrency issue um, between two, uh, two conflicting processes. Um, so we can randomize within our, our main server test packs and also we can we can randomize um, uh, I, through our SOAP harnesses the, the sort of different query workloads and shapes that, uh, that might come from a, 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 a customer live uh, in implementation. Iteration is is one of the probably one of the earliest kind of uh, uh, advances that we uh, that we put in place in our automation analysis to to uh, to try and help us with uh, with tackling the big data problem. And the the principle is is very simple. Um, basically, if you if you create a uh, t an automated test pack, um, for example, um, then you can run that pack again uh, multiple times. And if you design the tests or the steps within that pack such that through that iterative activity, um, the the checks that you're performing are still valid, but you are increasing perhaps one interesting scalability point uh, that you're that you're examining then what you can do is you can uh, you can examine the behavior of the system as that scalability point is stretched so for example um, if we had an iterative test pack that uh, on every iteration it injected more data into your system but then performed the same checks around how long it takes to run a query or how long it takes to run an administrative operation then what we can do is we can uh, we can examine this information we're capturing that uh, goes back to, to this principle of capturing as much information as possible. If we can examine that information we're capturing to, to see things like how much memory our processes are using as the number of imports in the system increases or, or how long it takes to run the same query as the number of, uh, of data partitions in the system goes up. So this ability to iterate can give us the ability to, to, to load up our, our, our servers and examine the, uh, the, the behavior of the system as that, uh, that operation operation goes on. Um, so here's a very a, a very simplified example of what we're looking for. So along the bottom is maybe uh, the number of iterations of a test pack that, that injects uh, more and more data into the system and uh, up the side is maybe the time in seconds of a specific test we're interested in, perhaps a, a query to count the, the, the data in the system or something like that or, uh, or, or an import, perhaps the import that itself um, we're looking at. So as you can see, if we look at the, the sort of blue line here, that would be a scalable um, uh, uh, function, you know, the, the time taken to run the, uh, the operation is not going up um, as the number of iterations of the test increases so hopefully uh, to the to the extent that we have tested we've got something that is scalable and, and very predictable um, the, the red line is is slightly less desirable but um, but it's still uh, it's still um, kind of good in the way that we've got a predictable linear relationship here um, that it appears that uh, as, as we inject more data into the system the the operation that we're looking at slows down in a in a linear way that uh, at least we can predict where it's going to go uh, to the to the extent that uh, that, that we've tested um, if we see something like this green line, then that would be very worrying. Um, you know, it, it appears to be quite a quite a healthy uh, performance at, at, the, at the outset in the early iterations. But as we iterate through, what we see is uh, is that, that we're getting a, a sort of exponentially slower. It might be that we've got some kind of tail recursion going on here, and as we can predict, at some point that is going to get to the point where that that operation is no longer uh, runnable, and um, and so we have uh, almost a hard limit in the system. So the testers will be looking for these kind of relationships in the system and certainly um, trying to get those resolved. So that's the sort of output we're looking for from these iterative tests. Okay, parameterization is, um, is 
an interesting one as well, and I think um, really important uh, because well, it, it takes time to develop test harnesses. It takes time to write automation, and um, and if that automation is designed just to run one specific uh, set of activities uh, with one set of, uh, of of inputs, then that that that's really kind of time that maybe uh, we've 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 spent that, that we could have made better use of. Um, by allowing parameters through the automation, what we can do is uh, we can we can reuse the tests, the test data we've designed, the test harness to try out different situations um, and, and different parameters in our in our tests, and that could give us really useful information. So, uh, for example, uh, the the core server test harness that we run, we can push in parameters to run. Maybe if we've got a new option to to try the query engine, for example, we can push in a parameter to every test in the query performance test run to to, uh, to give us information on uh, on how that parameter has affected our tests. And because we collect information on the time that it takes to run all of the tests, then um, we can compare back to uh, to other test runs, even ones that maybe haven't been specifically targeted as performance targets, we can analyze those and see if there's a, a significant difference. Um, here's an example of, of uh, uh, the, an activity that I, uh, I undertook um, a couple of years ago where we uh, we were testing our uh, JDBC connectivity and I'd written a, a, a JDBC harness uh, in order to to, to execute a, a multi-threaded um, uh, parallelized sort of query load against uh, against our system and in order to make the most uh, of that of that effort in writing the harness, what uh, what we did was put um, a uh, the ability at the back end for for selecting different connection pooling. Um, methods on the system. So, um, for example, no connection pooling at all, where we would create a new connection for every query that went in. Maybe pooling uh, only on the connection, but but reusing, uh, recreating statements against it. Maybe just having a single connection, um, or maybe creating uh, a new connection for uh, for each statement. So. That, um, that those different pooling al algorithms and, um, uh, allowed us to run the same test um, uh, against the system four different uh, in four different ways and get different information out. And as uh, as we can see here, the the kind of the the red and the, the purple lines appear to be behaving well um, uh, and uh, and not exhibiting any significant memory loss over the course of a, a sort of a, a significant soap test. The uh, the green line here is um, was an interesting one. Actually, I've I've sort of um, cut that off there it actually went on for much longer so it appeared that for with, when you're running with one connection um, uh, only then uh, then the statements would serialize through it and it would actually perform very badly but the memory behavior was good and obviously the interesting one here is that the blue line when we when we're um, uh, uh, pooling the connection only then it appears that we're losing um, uh, memory here we're, we're leaking memory quite dramatically through the course of the test now, as a word of warning here, because um, because actually on examining this, what I found was that that um, in in order to check that the connection was actually still alive, we were creating an object from the test harness against it, and then not cleaning that up. So it was actually the test harness that was uh, that was exhibiting the memory leak here, or causing the memory leak rather than necessarily the product itself. So that's a valuable lesson. It's it's uh, if we're designing automation to run uh, against uh, a big data systems then that automation itself needs to be uh, really really scalable and performant and not exhibit kind of uh, uh, memory leaks and, and other resource usage problems otherwise it's never going to be able to to deliver the workloads that we want to against our system um, I was pleased when I uh, after after reworking I added in some more parameters and actually did discover a memory leak when adding in a new a new parameter later for prepared statements so certainly a valuable uh, a valuable activity but we have to be careful Okay, so those are some of the, the different approaches uh, that uh, we've uh, put into our, our automation um, activities to try and give us a, a, a good a sort of chance of, uh, of, of identifying problems in, in the, this sort of big data, sort of massively parallelized system that we're testing. Okay, um, I wanted to sort of bring things to a close by talking a bit about Hadoop. Um, now anyone who's uh, looked at big data or is researching big data is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to navigate the big data arena without talking about Hadoop. It's become somewhat synonymous uh, with, uh, with big data. Um, and uh, it, I, I'll try and explain a little bit about, about what Hadoop is, but I think that it's really appropriate that, uh, that um, the, the, the 
uh, logo for Hadoop is an elephant because it, it, it reminds me of a story about, um, about three wise men who were blindfolded and asked to, uh, to, 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 to tell what an elephant was simply by touching it. And one man touched the elephant's leg and said, well, it's obvious it's a, it's a tree. Another man touched the elephant's ear and said, oh, it's obviously it's a, it's, it's a piece of leather. And another man touched the elephant's trunk and said, oh, obviously it's a snake. So Hadoop is a bit like that. If you ask a, a DBA, then they'll probably kind of consider it a sort of a database, whereas if you ask a sysadmin, perhaps they might tell you it's a file system, whereas if you ask a developer, they'll say it's, a, it's a, an application kind of development and, and job scheduling framework. And in, in, in all truth, it's, it's kind of all of these things. It, it sort of crosses a lot of boundaries. There is a file system element to, the, to it, which distributes files across um, many, many machines. Um, there, is a, uh, there are processing, uh, scheduling, engines in there that, uh, that, that can be used and then there are technologies that, that sit and use those scheduling engines to, 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 to perform uh, loads and, uh, and, and programmatical workloads on data files stored in Hadoop. So it's, it's a number of things to a number of people. Um, it's really exciting. Really exciting. You know, Hadoop is, is one of the sort of uh, the leading technologies in the in the big data arena. It is it is maturing now, but still on the downside, it's it's hard to get experience. So it's an exciting thing to be working with, but it is hard to find, uh, especially testers with any experience in Hadoop to, to bring to bear in there. So that is a that's a particular challenge, which hopefully will get easier over time, um, but uh, certainly one that we face. Um, it's constantly evolving. The pace of evolution of Hadoop is, is quite frightening. Um, and, and this kind of uh, is, is, is very good. It means that the, the problems are resolved quickly and, and there's constant movement. But at the same time, it means it's volatile. So maybe the, the technologies that you thought were that, that you were sort of integrating with uh, uh, six months or a year ago are no longer the, the core technologies in Hadoop that, uh, that they were. So for example, uh, PIG as a, as a language to, to read and write data may be slightly less exciting than, than it was a, a while while ago and, and uh, map produce as a scheduling engine is it was it was very much the one of the core elements of Hadoop uh, um, uh, not that long ago but now in more recent versions it's been replaced by others such as Tez so so the volatility is there you can't really integrate and expect that integration to to last and so this presents a huge challenge for testing if you have to test as we do across two or three versions of Hadoop then what you'll find is you'll be testing completely different technologies in the Hadoop stack that you're integrating with um, there's a number of different interfaces, as I've mentioned a few already. PIG um, it gives you programmatical access. You've got Hive for SQL and, 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 uh, and other SQL interfaces. So there's a number of different ways of interfacing with Hadoop. You've got H catalog, which gives you a sort of catalog view of the data. Um, this leads to complexity in, in, in the uh, in the system and, and a lot of complexity around testing it. Um, and a lot of the problems we see are around things like library dependencies and library versions and, and things with these interfaces. So, uh, so there is a lot of complexity there and we basically we, we have to, to use uh, virtualization a lot to, to ha have many many different Hadoop installations running where we can run our, our automated tests to gain confidence in each, uh, each flavor of Hadoop so there's, uh, there's uh, definitely a, a lot of challenges there and uh, being open source with multiple vendors, you've got uh, you've got Hortonworks, you've got Cloudera, you've got Mapar. There's, there's multiple vendors of this Hadoop technology, which leads to inconsistency. The latest release of, of Cloudera almost never has exactly the same versions of the Apache kind of stack in there as the latest release of Hortonworks. So there's always the need to test different flavors from different vendors, and that that can be uh, that can be uh, uh, an unwieldy challenge. So Hadoop does present, uh, whilst being an exciting technology. Technology as, a, as a big data technology and for a big data sort of um, tester, it can be a very challenging, uh, a very challenging environment. Okay, I think that just about brings me to the end of, of what I wanted to uh, to talk about. I think it's uh, we've we've got uh, a good ten minutes uh, for questions. So I'd like to to say thank you for for, for listening and uh, please do uh, get in touch. I've, you've got my Twitter handle and, uh, and and come and have a have a look at the the blog if you will. Um, I will try and remember to open a thread on Test Huddle once uh, once we've finished to. Uh, to, to get any feedback um, that, uh, that anyone may have and um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone um, can come up with now. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm just going to take back control of the screen very quickly to run through a couple more slides before we look at your questions. 
first of all, I want to share with you all a an ebook today on test management. And in, in the chat box there, you'll see a link that will bring you through to the ebook. And this ebook isn't available for download until tomorrow, but um, I'm going to share with you today the password for downloading. And you'll see here the password at the bottom of the page, H-T-A-Y-T-M, how to assess your test manager, 2015. So if you just take note of that, you'll be able to download the webinar. Tomorrow's webinar and the final webinar part of the Way We Work series is on the Internet of Things. It's coming with Professor Andy Stanford-Clark. And you can register there on huddle.com, Way We Work. And also tomorrow is the deadline for the early bird savings. So make sure um, you register by tomorrow to make up to 200 euros in savings on your ticket for Eurostar. And you can make even bigger savings if you register a group where every fourth uh, delegate or every group of four gets one ticket free. So you can bring five for the price of four. We also have a mobile testing event on the Friday after Eurostar. It's a one day testing event called Mobile Deep Dive. You can find out more information about this on the Eurostar website. Today's competition number is 99. So if you add that to the numbers from the Tuesday and Wednesday webinars, and we'll have one more number for you tomorrow before you can enter the draw for the ticket to the Eurostar conference. And now, finally, I'm just going to have a look at some of your questions. And um, the first question I have here for you is, what tools would you recommend to test a big data system? Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Dari. Yeah, well, uh, I think there's there's not really one answer here because because big data uh, is not really defined by its technology in perhaps the same way as as as, as web or, or mobile. I know those are diverse, but they 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 sort of uh, have a very kind of specific technology uh, um, environment which they're uh, which they're focused on whereas big data is is really one of the def defining elements of it is the variety of different products and tools in play so uh, I've, I've mentioned obviously ganglia as a, as a grid monitoring system that, that's very useful but really I think a really good understanding of the underlying operating system and the tools available um, are, are essential. So one of the things that we use most of the, are the tools that are, are available in our operating system and the tools to monitor that because what we're looking at are these, as I've mentioned, these non-functional kind of characteristics often of the system. So we need to, to really have a good, a good relationship with the operating system and what it's doing in order to in order to test it so rather not one tool but rather a toolkit and an approach that allows you to break down the product and understand the elements of the system and it might be that you have to pick different tools to test at the various layers I have another question here someone's asking um, how do you start using the Hadoop am I pronouncing that correct Hadoop yes um, uh, Hadoop. any hints or tips on how they can get started um, yes, I would. Um, the the Hadoop is 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 um, uh, open source, and uh, but there, there are the, obviously the, the sort of uh, the providers of it. Um, I would probably start uh, by looking at uh, either the HortonWorks or the Cloudera website, and I know that what what those guys do is they provide um, a sandbox, so you can download a virtual machine as a sandbox, which you can then run in a in a in a sort of VMware or, or other sort of virtual uh, environment. And those sandboxes often come with with uh, uh, sort of training elements to them, such that they will actually take you through setting up a, a job and, and, and loading some data into Hadoop and things like that. So I'd start with, with the Hortonworks and Cloudera websites and go and try and uh, try out their sandboxes. It's a great place to start. And, and um, there are, they, they do have kind of uh, university videos and things on there as well to help you understand the technologies. The next question here asks, what kind of skills are needed to test big data? Okay, um, I, I think that uh, I may have covered some of that already, but it's it's a tricky one. I think that uh, that there are so many elements uh, that are in play that um, that um, there's there's a lot of different skills, and, and one of the approaches that I 
I try and uh, take as a, as a test manager uh, in, in that context is to build a team out of a range of different people with different skills. Uh, so some of them maybe have SQL skills or, or sort of data analytics skills. Those are obviously very important for big data. There's also um, operating system skills and, and, and things like that. As I've mentioned, you need to understand the operating system um, and what it's doing. Um, so there's, there's a number of different skills that are relevant, but I think that some level of scripting is really important important to be able to schedule uh, workloads and, and be able to interact with the with big data systems they tend to be quite developer focused and quite programmatically sort of oriented so scripting languages are good understanding the operating systems that you're working on so sysadmin skills and database skills are, are really important the next question asks is continuous integration appropriate to big data testing um, that's a really good question. Um, yes, it, it is absolutely, um, and the reason that that, that it is is that um, that, as I've mentioned, any big data system um, typically can be made up of, of, of any number of smaller processes. You, you'll have the building blocks that make up the system. So it's not that you, as, as I hope I've, uh, sort of the, the slides and the presentation has has, uh, has given the, 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 the idea of the, you don't tackle it in a brute force way. You don't try and test your big data system just by getting a massive system and running all your tests against it. You, if you can break down those little layers of scalability and test maybe the components that make up the big data data system and make sure the processes that the that, uh, that, that are distributed out all work in, in isolation and then you test the glue layers and the metadata layers that join them together then you can you can do continuous integration um, I would say it's not you know the the target of uh, I hear some people saying uh, on web systems are oh, you shouldn't have a build and, and tests that, that take longer than 15 minutes that's impractical for big data you need to consider you know running running nightly tests and, and, and weekends uh, sort of longer runs but you can get continuous integration sort of builds that, that tell you if your if your system is still hanging together. Someone else here asks, what are effective techniques of test data management in big data ecosystem? That's a good uh, that's a good question. Um, and um, it's it's one that we struggle with, to be honest. It's, it, is, it has been difficult. What we tend to do is, uh, is have a uh, have a, a central location um, for uh, for the test data, and then we will we will essentially synchronise data out to individual machines uh, from that central location in order to uh, to furnish the tests. And, and we typically wouldn't try and synchronise all of our test data out to all of our machines. We just do it to the to the machines in question. So we have, and, and it goes back to the sort of parallelization as well as parallelizing across machines in our testing we also parallelize across clusters so every night for example we'll have um, a cluster running uh, small-scale functional tests on the on the data we'll have a cluster running query uh, performance and functional tests we'll have any number of clusters running Hadoop tests and, and tests against other storage technology so all of those will have a visibility of, of a subset of the data that, that we our central data that's needed to run those tests. Um, but what we do do um, it quite a lot is actually reuse the same data over and over again because, um, as I mentioned, you, you, what you're doing is breaking up the data, the, the workload in, and the data into, into many, many smaller components. So if you're smart about how you manage your data, you can reuse um, a, a few pieces of data and populate a system by changing maybe just one thing at a time or, or something like that and, and populate a system from, from a much smaller data source than, than necessarily goes into the, the final test system. So, uh, so yeah, we have some tests that bring, basically import the same data every night and just change the, the date uh, value so that we can drill down to that, that day, but the rest of the data is the same and that, that's, that's valid for testing because the, the data is contained in partitions which have no relationship with the other partitions in the system. Next question here says, when breaking data into subsets for manageable testing, which is most significant for, significant for performance? The size of each partition or the number of partitions used? 
Uh, that's a really good question, and and that's that's probably I would say it's probably a little bit specific to to uh, to my system. However, the the kind of the concept is the same in terms of uh, if you understand the the. the the pieces of data and then the the, 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 the pieces of the layers of, of processing that glue those individual pieces together then that's that's a valid approach for testing um, in 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 terms of the, the specific question, well, it depends on what you're looking at. Certainly, if you're looking at improving, uh, dramatically improving fast lookup performance to, to a partition, then it's the number of partitions that are interesting. You know, you want to eliminate down from millions of partitions down to just one in a short space of time. If you're looking at maybe a query or, or an activity which, which grinds through and does a, a big an, a sort of analytical job against lots and lots of data, then obviously the, the amount of data within the partitions is, is more relevant. So it the, the answer is, is is it depends. It depends on what the uh, what the really the user story is. Is it to, to to allow you to drill down very quickly to to a specific piece of information, or is it is it to, to grind through a lot of uh, a lot of data and a lot of uh, a lot of records? Um, we've gone over the hour now, so I'm just going to take one last question there, Adam. And um, and the the question yep. here asks. Uh, how does someone get into big data testing? Okay, that's uh, that, that's one that uh, that is 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 not not that easy to answer because I kind of fell into big data testing. I didn't do it intentionally, but uh, but as I've mentioned, I think with the growth of the Internet of Things and the the growth of kind of the need for big data testing in more and more products, it's something that's going to be more prevalent. So I think that that uh, the the question on Hadoop was really relevant there. That uh, maybe if you're interested in in big data, then learning about Hadoop technologies is really going to help you, even if the job that that, that comes up isn't directly related to Hadoop. If you've shown an interest and if you've shown an aptitude for working with a, a data system such as Hadoop, then that will really stand you in good stead. So I'd say, yeah, look, looking and getting familiar with the technology and the space is, is certainly something that uh, that will stand you in very good stead for, uh, for, for, for going into an interview for a big data product. Okay. Um... That's that's all we have time for today. I, I had a few people asking there as well for the, the password for the that test management ebook by Peter Morgan and Fabian Scarano. So I've just shared that with you again, but it's also going to be available. You, you'll see on the slides, we'll have the resource page live very shortly, and the slides from this webinar will be up there, so you'll be able to check back in the recording as well, and you'll see the password in case you've missed it. That's, um, that's all we have time for. So thank you again, Adam, for your presentation. And Thanks very much. We have one more webinar tomorrow, so make sure you tune in um, to the Internet of Things with Professor Andy Stanford-Clark, and you can register on the, the Way We Work page of Test Huddle. And we will see you over in Test Huddle. Take care, everybody, and goodbye.